So now that we have a good idea of what is involved with slavery and the fact that slavery has now essentially uh, become more viable with the creation of the cotton gin, let's take a look at what happens uh, after the invention of the cotton gin as the importation of fresh slaves from Africa starts to wind down. Well, in essence, this 150,000 new slaves uh, pumps a lot of new blood into the institution. Uh, in places where it was already fading, it continues to fade. But in places where it kind of plateaued out, it starts to all of a sudden grow again. Uh, in essence, slavery becomes resuscitated, but especially in the South. Well, slave states in, uh, in the East essentially become overcrowded with slaves. Uh, by 1840, for instance, some 50% of the Deep South population is enslaved. So in places like South Carolina, for every one white person, there's one enslaved person. Well, what do you do with this momentum in order to keep that momentum going? Slavery has to expand. In fact, that seems to be the only solution. Well, the problem is you've got plenty of slave supply because, of course, you also have natural increase uh, that will replace the importation of slaves. But um, you don't have more land unless you go and get it. Well, where's this land coming from? Originally from the old Southwest Territories. We're talking about Al Alabama and Mississippi. But pretty soon, Alabama and Mississippi are starting to get crowded with plantations as well. The good land gets gobbled up in a hurry. You know, if you've got a plantation in South Carolina and you want your kid to have a plantation, but there's no new land in South Carolina, what do you do? You head out to the frontier of Mississippi and buy up real estate. And that's where you set your son up in the plantation business. Both of these places, Alabama and Mississippi, grow cotton extraordinarily well. Well, this is alarming to Northerners. If you have a uh, desire to limit slavery or to eliminate slavery entirely, about the only way that you can get this done now is to hermetically seal it. And that becomes the new plan for po folks that are opposed to slavery. Well, this takes the form legislatively of a series of legislative duels, ultimately leading to the Compromise of 1820. Compromise of 1820, also known as the Missouri Compromise, essentially limits where slavery can expand to. Uh, the issue at hand was, will territory west of the Mississippi River be open to slavery? Prior to this, there was no question. The old Northwest Ordinance had said all those states in the present-day Midwest of the United States would be free. The Southwest Ordinance said slavery would be allowed. But after the Louisiana Purchase, that question comes up again. As the United States moves west of the Mississippi River, the old laws are no longer valid. They're no longer um, germane. So the Missouri Compromise says, all right, where can slavery uh, expand to, and where will it be excluded from? The ultimate result of this is that Missouri comes in as a slave state, but slavery is restricted to all territory south of the southern boundary of Missouri, which means, essentially, Arkansas Territory and present-day uh, Indian, or Oklahoma, then the Indian Territory, and Louisiana. Well, what about Texas? Remember, in 1820, Texas is still part of the Spanish Empire, soon to be part of the Mexican uh, nation. But anybody with a clear sense of geography understood that if slavery is going to continue to expand, Texas is going to have to become part of the United States. And this idea of expanding slavery certainly flavors and taints uh, different schemes for separating Texas from Mexico and adding it to the U.S. Well, here's what's driving this. It's money. Cotton is, in fact, becoming king. Um, 
you could grow cotton for about 12 cents a pound. Only took about 12 cents a pound to produce, and this includes uh, hands, feeding your hands, everything that's used to go in to capitalize this operation. Yet, you could sell cotton for about four or five times that amount. So the amount of margin is vast. There's a lot of money to be made. So people start in Mississippi, for instance, fairly poor, but if they have a couple of good cotton crops, all of a sudden they have gone from the poor white class into the middle class, heading towards the upper class. This was the pathway to social mobility. So therefore, Texas seemed like an absolute godsend not only was there land being given away by the Mexican authorities, but if you got that land and turned it into productive cotton land, all of a sudden you would be wealthy beyond your imagination. Well, this process helps lead to the Texas Revolution, and then once Texas is a state, slavery moves in in a big way. You know, by 1860, about one in four Southerners owned slaves. So, restated, the typical Southerner owned zero slaves. But the ones that did own slaves were making money. Uh, of those slave owners, the one in four that in fact owned slaves, about 52% of them, about a little over half, owned fewer than five, say one to five slaves. Another 35% owned between five and 20. 12% of the slave owning population own 20 or more. Of the entire slave owning population of the American South, only 3% of the entire slave owning population owns 20 or more slaves. Okay, that said, this 3% of the 25% of the white population owning slaves in the South, this 3% ends up becoming the ruling class. They are the cotton elite, the slave-owning elite, and they color everything in the South in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. <laughs>